Welcome, everybody. This is uh, entitled Museum Digital Content as Journalism, uh, an approach to original content. Um, and uh, myself and Brad Dunn will be presenting. And we have a pretty limited amount of time. So what we're going to do is each do about 10 minutes talking about uh, teeing up some ideas and uh, presenting some concepts. And then we really want to open it up for questions. And uh, hopefully, we can get some good dialogue started and take the conversation away after this, since we don't have a whole lot of time. Um, uh, in here. Uh, could somebody do me a favor and grab the door? <laughs> um, uh, that would be awesome. Thank you. Um, so just, uh, just to start off, I'm the Chief Digital Officer at the Franklin Institute, which is big science museum in uh, Philadelphia. Um, I have been there only two years. I'm kind of an outlier in the museum world. I do not come from museums. This is the first two years I've ever worked in a museum space. Um, and uh, I come from broad-based digital publishing. So I was vice president of digital for National Geographic for eight years, doing National Geographic news and journalistic um, science storytelling. And before that, I was at America Online. I launched TMZ. Like, that's a whole other story. Um, so that's the world I come from, which is digital content. Um, I don't necessarily come from museums. So it was a real interesting process for me to learn how museums think. So when I came to the museum world, I, it, how museums see themselves as communicators was one of the most fascinating things that I learned about. Um, very local. In fact, just inside the museum, I was completely shocked at how museums were not yet thinking of digital, uh, social media, website, as really anything other than marketing. Um, a driving attendance or extensions of the physical, not entities of themselves that could just be where the mission lives in a completely separate endeavor from what you're doing on site. That museums really didn't see themselves as storytellers um, and journalistic content creators. They're fact checking, they're telling stories, they're creating content, but they were museum people, they were curators. You know, storytellers in a limited sense, but that was it. That was the box that I felt like museum folks, many museum folks kind of put themselves in, which I thought was really uh, surprising. And what you saw was scientists and curators who worked at your museum were being the story someplace else. Other people were covering them and you weren't telling your own stories. You know, they were being farmed out as experts somewhere else. So fact-checking, sourcing, writing, audience-specific content delivery, everything I had done in the journalism community was being done inside the museums and being done inside our museum, but not necessarily in the way that I was used to thinking, but it was all there. So that brought up a key question for me. Why couldn't, and I'm from a science museum, like why couldn't a science museum be National Geographic News? Why couldn't it be New York Times Science? Why couldn't it be I fucking love science and have a Facebook presence where all you did was talk about science on Facebook and that's all you did? So one of the key questions I got when we were, I was sort of bouncing this idea around is why would you do this? And really it comes down, in my opinion, to a really key element. Museums must evolve. And relevancy and context and immediacy of the content you're presenting is going to be critical to that. Now, I do I understand this is different per museum. So if your museum is an art museum and your mission is a certain way, this might not apply. So I, I think we lump museums together in kind of this really weird way that doesn't actually apply to everybody. Science and natural history museums are in a really unique space in which they can tell um, relevant stories, whereas an art museum might find a hard way, might find that challenging to contribute to. But it's, uh, <laughs> yeah, right, but, but maybe not. And I think, um, you know, the uh, audiences are going to expect content and information to be relevant and immediate. That's how they learn, is it has to relate to something. So when you're talking about earthquakes, why can't we be talking about the earthquake that just happened in Mexico, instead of talking about some generic earthquake and referencing that, um, I, you know, in, in some broad term? Um, technology is going to continue to evolve at an exponential rate and the delivery mechanisms that, you know, for that content even faster. So it's my belief that audiences will simply not accept how museums have chosen to deliver content to their audience, which is maybe refreshing their exhibition space, you know, even annually is not going to cut it. And so I think it's thinking of ways to get ahead of that in far, as far as how information consumption is going to be expected among audiences. You can reach more people. 
bring your museum's mission to a national and a global audience. And this was one of the toughest things that our museum has had to get its head around as far as why. And you know, it was uh, when we launched an experience where you could access it, a mobile app that could be accessed globally and used globally. And I was like, oh, people in Kansas can do it, and China. And our marketing team was like, oh, right, right, right. So when they come to Philadelphia, they will come to the Franklin Institute. And I'm like, no, they stay in China. And they learn about science <laughs> from us. And they're like, I don't get it. So there you go. Um, and the role that museums can play in our current information crisis. And I do not throw it, we are in an information crisis, absolutely, globally, but especially in this country. And museums have a really powerful role to play as trusted communicators of information in that. Um, and Brad's going to talk a little bit more about that um, uh, next. So some examples, some museums are doing this. Um, uh, Cal Academy has Biographic, which is a whole separate science um, news experience that is a science magazine that has a separate uh, Facebook page, a separate entity, and is their sort of science news storytelling platform, which I think is a good example. Uh, the Field Museum, which is why Brad's here, I think is doing a fantastic job of creating original content for digital. You've got Emily Grasley's The Brain Scoop. She has a phenomenal YouTube channel and also some of the other blogs and content that the field creates. Uh, I just found out about, this is the Science and Technology Museum in Perth in Western Australia reached out to me and they just launched Particle, which is their science news storytelling platform attached to the museum, which I thought was really great and well done. Obviously, you've got Smithsonian. They have Smithsonian TV, Smithsonian Magazine, Smithsonian.com, so they're really trying, they're kind of a, you know, a beast into themselves. And many of you work uh, here work for them. Um, we're doing, so what's the Franklin Institute doing? Just a, This just launched, soft launched on Monday. Um, so one of the ways that we're uh, dipping our toe in this water is uh, doing science stories, which is a storytelling platform about everyone the science story, and it's trying to get at this emotive quality of science communication, and what, what was the spark that sort of ignited science for everyone, that you remember first seeing a meteor shower, or you remember first realizing satellites were going around, when you realized the world was kind of bigger than yourself, and how does that inspire you and sort of inspire an interest in science? So we're doing an online curated experience, a user-generated experience, and a storytelling experience on site. And I've heard some great examples here of, um, of different projects, storytelling projects like that. But I think the interesting thing about this, while there's an on-site component, that's not the goal. The goal is to get this to go viral on social media and be a global phenomenon and things that people are talking about. If no one comes to the Franklin Institute because of this project, I will consider that success, like a raging success. My boss might feel otherwise. <laughs> the other thing we're working on um, uh, in relation to this is partner, uh, partnerships with local journalists. So this is an idea we've had of how we, uh, as a museum, get together with local journalists to co-develop content um, as well as do cross-training and experiences. So training uh, journal science communicators and journalists on virtual reality and then having them create some great content that we distribute in our virtual reality mobile app. So how do you start to learn from local journalists and also bring them in so you're starting to do this co-production um, uh, experience setup? So we're, you know, a lot of these are general concepts. We've been working on a lot of stuff at the Franklin Institute, so we're just starting to get into this. Um, and so these are kind of just general concepts to get everybody thinking about the role that museums can play. And I'm going to let Brad go into much more detail about what they're doing at the Field Museum. And, and you inspired me, so I'm going to stand up too. <laughs> All right. All right, thank you. Yeah. All right, so uh, my name is Brad Dunn. I'm with the. Uh, um, I'm with the Field Museum in uh, Chicago, Illinois. I'm the Web and Digital Communications Director. We are um, located on the museum campus right between beautiful Lakeshore Drive and the lake. We were founded, just a tiny bit of background, um, September 16th, 1893. In 1922, we moved into this building, and next year will be our 125th anniversary. Um, so what do we do? And when I say we, I mean all of us in this room. There's many art museums here, but there's also science and natural history museums. So we're known for our collections. We're, of course, known for one big specimen in uh, Sioux, basically the largest, uh, most complete T-Rex that's been found. Everyone knows this. They also know that we have the Savo lions on display, the actual taxidermied animals you can see um, in a case. But we also have the skulls. This happened to be standing um, or sitting on a, um, a table as I walked through the mount room, mount shop one day. 
Um, we also, like all of us, have these really beautiful specimens, right? This guy here is my favorite little puffer fish. I got a picture of this on members' night. So what do we do with these stories, right? We've got all these um, things across anthropology, uh, botany, geology, zoology, and we use these things to tell stories. So we do this in a variety of ways, right? Now, we're leading up to something. So here is a pretty ho-hum Facebook post that we posted um, over the summer. It's just basic research, right? This little guy I find to be pretty cute, and this is just a very short post about how the researchers have discovered the way to tell the difference between two very similar species of octopus is actually through their warts. That's the correct response, yeah. So it reached, <laughs> it's interesting, some people responded to it, it reached about 8,400 people, it had a few shares. When we add a little bit of sex to it, it quadruples the reach immediately, right? So this is a post about these cute little guys um, it, that talks, this is a, a kind of a concept I can't believe that we were researching, but sex with different partners might increase the odds of passing one's genes onto the next generation. That seems pretty obvious. Obviously the reach quadrupled, we had more shares, we had more clicks. We've also taken this approach where we try to make it relevant to topical events, which you were talking about, Susan. Um, this is a story about the um, airplane that Captain Sully safely landed on the Hudson River. When uh, researchers from the Smithsonian pulled the birds out of the engines, they actually came to the Field Museum to, uh, to examine some of our specimens, and in doing so, comparing uh, geese from our collection to what they found in the engines, they were able to determine that the geese were migratory birds, not local to New York, and that helped the authorities sort of problem solve in the right way, right? So this had decent reach and some engagement, um, but this we're trying to make it uh, topical to people. So why do we do this? Well, curiosity, it's an important part of the museum's mission. This is a quick aside, but I always have to talk just for a moment about this whenever I'm speaking. Why is curiosity important? Curiosity, according to Harvard Business Review and a lot of other literature, literature out there, is as important as intelligence, IQ, or EQ. It's the thing that allows people to deal um, with higher levels of stress and anxiety. It's the thing that allows people to absorb more information and uh, it enables them to sort of, as they say, manage the complexity of the 21st century. So curiosity is important, right? How do we do this? What is it we're sharing? We're sharing facts, which this year suddenly seemed uh, optional or took on a variety of definitions. And I'll give you a great example of this. So. Um, a while back, uh, the EPA chief, Scott Pruitt, made the statement that carbon dioxide is not a primary contributor to global warming. So this puts us in new territory, because before now, we would just talk about global warming, but now we have government officials telling us that, that, uh, that the science is, is, uh, is, they think it's something else. Well, this is obviously incorrect. So we had a moment where we had to figure out what is it, how are we going to respond to this? This was my original proposal for a Facebook post, which obviously, <laughs> which, <laughs> which obviously we did not go with, but there was just, we had a moment of real uh, frustration. And this is actually what we did post, right? We didn't call Scott Pruitt out by name. We just simply um, put a graphic up and linked to a longer uh, post uh, at one of our partner websites about how global warming actually does work. The carbon dioxide does actually contribute to climate change and to global warming. So there's been other examples of this throughout the year, unfortunately, right? So we withdrew from the Paris Climate Agreement. Now, we actually had some notice on this one. We knew that this announcement was coming, so we had time to sort of think about it and figure out what it is we wanted to do. So we actually reverted to something we had done earlier in the year. Uh, the president of the museum, Richard Lariviere, had written uh, an, a letter to the staff, making it very clear what our values were and what we stood for. So we went to him and asked if we could po post part of his letter on Facebook and link to it on our blog, and he agreed. So now we're getting we're inching along, we're getting away from just facts and, and um, peaking curiosity, we're now having a point of view, right? It's something that, that at least the Field Museum had not done a ton of over time. So the science is clear that the Earth's climate is changing because of us. So we're making a real statement. Now, um, we did, uh-oh, whoa. <laughs> so we did this earlier in the year, this was actually the first time we did it, a point of view but not actually science. This was shortly after the election and President Trump tried to pass the, the immigration ban. Um, this is the first time uh, Richard sent out a letter to the museum and he made it very clear that we will stand by our long history of welcoming immigrants and talented people from around the world to join us in the open exchange of ideas that further science. Not really about science, but it speaks to our values. We're a big research institution. We do have people that come from all over the world to do their postdoc work. Um, so not science, but as you can see, the, um, the reach skyrockets when we do this sort of thing. We reach 142,000 people, it's, um, it's shared over 600 times. We, we get really good engagement when we do this sort of thing. Here is actually the other the, and only other time we did this this year, and this was uh, when we actually advocated for people 
Um, so we got in the participation game, actually advocated for people to join the March for Science. The March for Science in Chicago is the second biggest in the country outside of DC. And as you can see, people are responding very, very positively when we do this, right? So this reaches 160,000 people. It's shared over 500 times. We get a lot of click engagement. We can see how long people are staying on the blog post, how long they're reading it. But this now is putting us into an interesting position. Are we experts or are we advocates, right? So going back a few years, there's some great research uh, from the UK Museums Association um, basically saying that there's some evidence and some research to show that the more likely we are to take a stance on advocacy, we potentially um, risk our uh, status as trusted experts, right? So this is something that we have to think about. This same research, if you, I don't know if you can read it, but in the middle column, if you look at things like care and preservation of heritage, holding collections, mounting displays, these things that we all do, uh, respondents rated those as things that we must do or as things we should do. But if you get down to the bottom, promoting social justice and human rights and provide a forum for public debate, we were rated as those are things we should not do, right? But we can go forward a few years. I'm sure everyone here reads Colleen Dillon Schneider's uh, amazing blog at knowyourownbone.com. But as part of the Impact's National Awareness, Attitude, and Usage Study, um, the question, are, do you strongly agree or strongly disagree that museums are highly credible sources of information? All of those uh, along the left side of the graph are all museums, zoos, and aquariums. And then the, the, small, the, the uh, lowest rated ones are, of course, government agencies. But then over on the far end is newspapers. So there's this indication that people trust us more than they trust, actually, newspapers. Very similar graph. Strongly agree or disagree that museums are trusted. We all rate in 75, 76, and 7. Newspapers are down at 67, and of course, government agencies are lower. So from Ms. Dylan Schneider herself, are museums trusted because they are not seen as having political agendas? I'm not yet certain of the exact nature of the relationship between being political and being trustworthy. So I would say that the, the, the jury is still out. We are certainly pushing it this year to see how far we can take it. Um, so there's these types of posts that we can do which are relevant to people. That is a tiny piece of moss that was found uh, by investigators investigating um, a major case in Chicago where 300 um, uh, graves were desecrated. And our head of botany collections was able to analyze that moss and his analysis of where it grew in the, in the, um, in the cemetery led to the conviction of two people in that case. So this was a big thing in the news in Chicago. So that's relevant, right? And it reached 26,000 people and it got some shares. Then we show something that's just surprising, like a really interesting fact. Um, this is our fishes collection manager, um, Caleb McMahon, and this is a uh, coelacanth, which is, I don't know if you guys know what that is, it's a humongous, really rare fish, and it's more closely related to humans than it is other fish. That's surprising, weird, and cool. This reaches 212,000 people, it's shared over 800 times, we get a bunch of engagement, um, it, it goes really well. But the ultimate um, test of how far could we like participate in this sort of campaign of advocacy was something that many of us in this room did this year, which was participate in Day of Facts. This became the farthest reaching post in the museum's history on any social media channel. This just on Facebook alone reached 2.8 million people. The video was viewed 1.1 million times with the big Facebook asterisk right next to that, of course. Um, but this thing was shared over 18,000 times. It had enormous engagement. Um, it helped it was picked up in the press, but I think it was picked up in the press because it really took a stand on really hugely controversial topics such as we are all immigrants from Africa, birds are dinosaurs, and other really basic facts. But we felt the need to sort of try to own that. Um, it's interesting that we're at a point in time where even just taking ownership of like these things that I didn't previously think were very controversial, um, but that's the position we find ourselves in that we're having to do. And I. To be honest, the question is still out. It's still something I'm testing. I'm open to discussion with people. Are, how far can we go in being uh, advocating for these causes and advocating for facts and science and beliefs um, and the role that art plays? Or do we need to be careful of that and honor more our role as experts? So that's the question that we're gonna spend time uh, thinking about over the next year. So thank you very much. So one thing I just wanted to follow up on, on something that Brad said is that I hear this a lot in the museum world, which kind of shocks me about this political agenda advocacy. Truth is not a political agenda. Like climate change is real. Evolution is real. It is. And if you're a science museum, that is not 
taking a side, that is not having a political agenda, that is simply telling the truth. And that is what experts are supposed to do. So I think in this era of communication where, oh, thanks. <laughs> But like this era of communication, those are not discussions that we should feel uncomfortable about in the slightest. And that's part of the problem of this information crisis as we are now being made to feel like those should be debatable topics, you know? And the Franklin Institute is just also starting to dip its toes in those waters, which is, I'm loving seeing because it makes my boss really uncomfortable. Um, but it's good because we're now having board members who are coming in and funding speaker series on why vaccines work and gun control. And they're really encouraging us to really participate in these conversations even more. So what I'd love to do is open it up for questions uh, um, uh, to us about anything. Yeah. Sure. So full disclosure, as I answer that question, uh, Emily, it, the, the Brain Scoop is owned by the Field Museum and it operates within the Field Museum, but Emily and her two producers are a pretty independent entity. We have bi-weekly like, coordination meetings where we coordinate on topics, so I don't want to speak for Emily too much. Uh, I, I do know that the idea of making an ask in the middle of a, of a video was uh, controversial for some people and a no-brainer for some, which means it was really controversial. Um, <laughs> and so... Uh, I don't think it came anywhere near subsidizing the cost of it, but I don't know that that was the goal. I think the goal was to simply try it because it came in the heels of us doing the Hyena Diorama, which was a crowdsourced campaign to redo it, one of a, an old diorama that was a sort of a, pers a, a sort of a pet project for Emily that she wanted to do. So it was just kind of more experimentation about how could how could we do uh, fundraising in social media with science storytelling. So that was actually more the the goal there. So. Um, well, another full disclosure, I'm, I'm real lucky because I have, um, I have really good support above me, so I've got wide latitude to fail and try things. In fact, there was a period of time that went by about a year and a half when I, I hadn't gotten in trouble for anything, and uh, my boss actually told me I wasn't quite pushing hard enough, so I, I then did get in trouble pretty quickly after that, um, <laughs> something with a Sue Twitter feed. Um, but the, uh, to answer your question, I think... It's always important to show people how the needle moves, right? And you can't show people how the needle moves unless you try things. So it's this thing that has become sort of a buzzword now, but like, you know, fail fast and, you know, you, that's the only way that we learn. That's the only way that you get data. You might post something and you get outrage from people. We did have a lot of negative comment. We'll, we'll post this online uh, at some point and you can see in the actual analytics, like, we got some angry uh, responses on Facebook, but it was like, you know, 0.0005%. So... You know, it, when you're, I guess the thing is, is that w if you're going to take a stand on things, you're going to have people mad at you. There's just, that's got to be acceptable. Um, but you won't really know till you try. So I guess I would try to convince your management to give it a shot and see how it works. And uh, maybe even do it for a while and then follow up with some sort of qualitative and or quantitative sort of research to see how it's being perceived. I would say, uh, from my perspective, I, I'm also lucky. I have a lot of support, um, pr but I'm not where we are at the Franklin Institute. We're not quite where the Field Museum is and getting in trouble. Um, we post a lot of climate change stuff on social media, and we do get a lot of flack. And it's it's been a slow process, so it gradually ease them into it. And I think what we've seen is when we started doing content um, that wasn't talking about ourselves, the engagement is so much higher, you win them with the numbers. And that's something you yeah. know Brad's talked a yeah, lot about sure. in the past, is that 
you can just go in and at any point, even if the engagement is people fighting and arguing, they're talking about science. Yeah, discussion. And like right. they're they're like what what will be awesome is you'll see someone jump into a comment thread on climate change and make an anti climate change, and then the audience eats them alive, and they kind of fight each other, and mm -hmm. you don't have to get in there. You're just setting the stage. But those are always some of our most highly engaged posts and some of our most highly reached. So going into my boss and saying, if we were to take all of this away and just talk about tickets and events, that all that traffic disappears. And they're like, well, no, 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 don't do that. And then they kind of get there and they kind of get there and they kind of get there. So I, yeah. my, my dream is to get where Brad is, but I think, you know, <laughs> you, you can ease them in. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so my name's Alex. I'm kind of the strategist for Minneapolis Beach of the Bar. And we have... Right. Um, right. Yes. Hi. Good to see you. Good to see you guys too. Uh, and we, we have kind of an um, uh, a kind of um, a developing uh, kind of editorial board uh, that we're that we're building so that we can engage authentically with current issues and perhaps even develop our own advocacy. Yeah. And I think for us, as it's called trending now, we also have a in gallery uh, cool. rapid fire labeling initiative called New Swap. And for us, what was really important in terms of the initial conversations that we had really, well, you know, what do we stand for? What are our values? And what can we speak authentically about? Um, and so I think, you know, it, to answer your question, that, you know, if you can kind of get alignment around those two key conversations, then, you know, you, you may find more and more buy-in from the top. Yeah, I like that idea of an editorial board. That I think is a is yeah, a it's great it's thing because it also could engage members of your board in having more of an active conversation. And if you get supportive members on on that, that could be an influence to uh, to the rest. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, no. I kind of obsess over them, so I can tell you that it's. Um, <laughs> it, uh, I know that Facebook is saying video, 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 and I actually think it's about the content of the imagery more than yep. anything else. Um, if people can see right, if 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 the thing is interesting to them, and, and in this case, what we're learning um, to to my own surprise this year has been that when we take a strong stand, people are responding to that, whether we do it in video or post an image with a pull quote from the president's from our president's letter. Um, and we post to Facebook once a day, no more than twice a day. But some of, it, like specifically like my colleague institutions like AMH and, and Smithsonian, they do post more. Um, and we're actually gonna go into a period of experimentation where maybe we'll do more. We have found that we get lower engagement per post when we post more. Mm -hmm. So we've held pretty true, and I take a lot of heat for it, but um, we're kind of sticking by it. Yeah, our cadence is two times a day. So uh, usually day parted, morning, evening, we sometimes push that. Cadence is an organizational appetite thing. It's really what your audience will tolerate without drop off. Um, I totally agree on content types. We've always heard this, videos get more reach, and it's all about the content. Um, if it's a great video, it'll get the reach. If it's a great, we've got a thing that's trending right now, which is just a link to an article on science showing why people hate mayonnaise. <laughs> and that's just exploding. So, you know, it, but that, and that's a link, and it's not even a video or an image. And so if the content's great and your audience clicks, it'll, it'll go. Go ahead. Well, we're just at that stage now where I think we're going to be having those kinds of conversations with local journalists. I think it's a, there are uh, local science journals that are great at telling certain types of stories. So we've talked about doing the science of Philadelphia and the engineering of that. And there might be scientists that are much, or local science journalists that are much more skilled and connected already with the SEPTA system and all of those kinds of things. So then there are things that we're the expert on, where I think the journalists would actually benefit from our expertise. And so I think it's, you know, going in to each thing that you want to cover and thinking what's the right relationship for that. On the traffic side, I mean, one of the benefits, so we have more Facebook followers by probably, I'm going to roughly say times three than any local media group in all of Philadelphia. 
So from an audience perspective, we are now in a position where we can help them with reach to local audiences. So that's another way to leverage positions with local media is they kind of need you as much as you need them from a content and storytelling. One example we just did when we covered the eclipse with our chief astronomer, we partnered with philly.com. They logged in. They pulled the... Um, the li Facebook live feed because they didn't have an expert on site so they took our Facebook live feed straight into philly.com now that bypasses us but now it's set up a partnership with philly.com where we yeah. can do more of that in the future Go ahead. Um, we're talking about posting content types um, have you posted any 3D data any 3D imagery for sketch travel on Facebook and what kind of experience have you had with that event? we have not done that we just did it with Terracotta Warriors. I don't think we did, did we do my editorial oh, directors here? We didn't put Sketchfab on Facebook. Yeah. Oh, sorry, it was, have we ever used 3D modeling like Sketchfab inside Facebook and what was the result? And Brad had not, and we've only, we haven't done it, we just got the Sketchfab models, but we haven't released them on Facebook, so. Yeah, and then, yeah go ahead. Absolutely, I, it's very new, um, but what we're looking at as far as amplifying, not just promoting it organically on our platforms, but par again, partnering with folks. So um, I'm talking to National Geographic, we have some local media teams that are interested in promoting science stories and potentially partnering with, uh, with us on that. Um, Another idea that's come up is Story Collider, which is very similar, like scientists telling their story, but they don't have a Philadelphia presence yet. So do we partner so that we do a moth-style stand-up for science stories, which is local awareness? I think the partnerships is going to be, if you're going for a national and global audience, I'd much rather partner with somebody who can help me get there than try to do it myself. It's always going to be more expensive and harder. So I think once we have a little bit more content in the can and we can kind of showcase what science stories is Po what's possible with that, those partnerships are going to be a, an exciting opportunity. Um, so. Yeah, we haven't. Uh, we haven't uh, uh, created a medium. We're creating a blogging <laughs> platform on our own uh, on site uh, on our own site, but haven't thought about reaching out to media. So. Yeah, I think we're out of thank time, you. but thanks, everybody. Thank you.